So good afternoon, everyone. Let, we, let me welcome you all to this special session on regulatory developments that the Financial Stability Institute traditionally organizes annually in the context of this BIS annual general uh, meeting. For this year's uh, panel, uh, we have chosen a highly topical theme, policy approaches to address, address risks posed by crypto assets and decentralized, uh, and decentralized finance. I don't, I don't think we need to spend much time in, in explaining why we have selected this topic for uh, today's event. Undoubtedly, uh, crypto assets uh, and DeFi-related activities raise concerns related to different uh, policy object objectives associated to the adequate functioning of the financial system. Uh, and this includes financial stability, market integrity, consumer protection, and also competition. Concerns uh, may stem from possible contagion to the traditional financial system, the intensive use of uh, liquidity and maturity mismatch and, and also leverage, but without having appropriate governance arrangements and adequate risk management uh, capabilities, the opacity uh, related to participants and modus operandi, and the vertical integration of different functions that could create some conflicts of, of interest. Uh, Recent developments uh, have arguably, arguably strengthened the case to find an adequate regulatory response that could help control those risks. First, over the past uh, few years, we have seen rapid expansion in activities related to crypto assets and, and DeFi. Institutional players have increased uh, their involvement with and interest in crypto asset related activities. But more significantly, actually, the retail investors are showing an increasing appetite to actually acquire some types of crypto, crypto assets, uh, despite actually relatively high market uh, volatility. So it is estimated now that over 230 million people around the world own crypto assets in December 2022, uh, as compared to only 5 million in 2016. So second, the crypto market has experienced persistent turmoil since uh, 2022, the so-called crypto, crypto winter. In May, before the crypto winter, actually, May 2022 uh, 20, alone, one third of the crypto asset market capitalization evaporated, uh, thereby generating important losses for, for investors. <coughs> and this period also saw significant contagion across the crypto, uh, crypto asset ecosystem the demise of uh, several crypto asset intermediaries, and also the pegging and failure of several stablecoin arrangements. Third, while direct connections between crypto assets and, and the traditional financial system remain uh, limited, exposures could eventually become material. Moreover, as the recent bank turmoil uh, has shown, this interaction between actually crypto asset inter intermediaries and regular traditional financial institutions could potentially be in both directions and certainly can take different shapes and, and forms. And fourth, as a report recently, recently published by the Financial Stability Institute shows, in the, in the past few years, many national authorities have become more active in, in exploring regulatory responses to address the risk posed by, by crypto for different policy objectives. Uh, of course, uh, those are positive, positive develop, development, but also true that the cross-border nature of crypto asset related activities may lead to regulatory arbitrage and, and fragmentation, especially if, of course, there is no sufficient cooperation, coordination, and harmonization of regulatory requirements in different parts of the, of the world. But the good news, of course, is that the standard setting bodies uh, have taken the issue very seriously. They have invested significant resources in the past few years with a view to understanding and mitigating such risks. And this work has culminated in the publication of standards, uh, reports, and guidelines on the, on the matter. But of course, this is a fast evolving market and significant work remains to be done. So this panel is about precisely this. We will discuss the journey standard setting bodies and international organizations have taken so far to address the risk posed by, by crypto assets and, and DeFi, and particularly how they plan actually to continue to make progress with a view to supporting national authorities to achieve their mandates. 
For that purpose, uh, we are fortunate to, to be joined by a superb uh, lineup of speakers who are extremely well placed to cover these important issues from different policy angles. So let me introduce first uh, Violin Clare, Executive Secretary of the Financial Action Tax Force, dealing uh, essentially with AML, CFT type of, type of policies. So welcome, first time you are here, welcome Violin. Uh, second, Neil Esho, uh, Secretary General of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Uh, Martin Muleni, Secretary General of the International Organization Securities Commission. John Cylinder, uh, recently appointed Secretary General of the Financial Stability Board. It was the first time here, so welcome very much, John. And last but not least, we have Takeshi Shirakami, is Deputy Head of uh, the Secretariat of the Committee on Payments and Market Infrastructure, who is replacing Tara Rice, who was... Uh, who had to step down uh, because of uh, unexpected, unexpected uh, developments. So thank you, the five of you, very much for taking the time uh, to participate in this session. We, of course, very, we are looking forward to knowing actually what you have done in this important domain and particularly what are your plans for the forthcoming, for the forthcoming future. So we'll propose to organize the, the, this panel discussion as follows. We'll start with uh, asking you just to provide a brief summary of the work that you have been doing and the plans for the, for the future. And then we'll ask you, ask you a more specific question that will allow you actually to dig deeper in, in some aspects of the, of the work that you have been, you have been uh, uh, conducted. Then immediately after, I will obviously open the floor uh, for general comments, remarks from the, from the audience. I encourage you to participate actively. Uh, the way we are going to do that is very simple, traditional way, raise your hand, and somebody will actually hand the microphone to to you. And let me also mention to all of you that this session is going to be recorded, is being recorded, and will be posted in the BIS website within the couple, next, couple of, within the next couple of days. So with that, let me just ask uh, Violin to start, to, to kick off this, this discussion, so looking forward to your remarks, and then we'll go with Neil, uh, Martin, then John, and, and finally Takesh. Mm? Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, so this is a great opportunity being there today uh, to share with all the financial standard setters our challenges in responding to the development in the crypto sector. As this issue is not just a fast moving and technical issue, it's also one that raises some fundamental challenges to the way we regulate financial activity. So it's essential that all of the global regulatory bodies uh, can learn from each other and take a coherent approach. So again, thank you for convening this panel. On the main question, what have we done so far? So in 2019, the FATF has already extended its standards to require countries to treat virtual assets and service provider in broadly the same way that they treat financial institution, meaning that uh, uh, based on the principle, same risk, same rule, we uh, expect the virtual asset service provider and that uh, ensuring that uh, they are licensed or registered, that they conduct customer due diligence, report suspicious transaction, and that they are subject to effective supervision and sanction. At the level of the FATF and with the global network, we ensure implementation of these standards across our 205 jurisdictions in a range of ways, including mutual evaluation. As you know, our focus is uh, anti-money laundering, counter-terrorist financing, and the pro uh, proliferation of mass destruction. But there are strong links in what we are doing with supervision and the other kind of supervision, prudential conduct. Prudential is clearly obvious that governance, internal control rules, operational risk are common ground for the FATF and the prudential supervision. So it is really important to us that we promote a coherent crypto uh, regulatory system, which can contribute to the stability, but also to the integrity of the financial system. So how do we implement our standard? Implementation, of course, is a challenge. Why? Because what we have observed as the last few years is new, that new and traditional terrorist groups, including ISIL and Al-Qaeda, are increasingly turning to virtual assets to raise and move funds. A 
ransomware attacks also have risen significantly and payments are now almost exclusively demanded in virtual assets. These attacks can have a devastating impact on critical infrastructure. And countries like North Korea, for example, are taking advantage of crypto providers to steal funds that, they are, that are used to finance their weapons of mass destruction program. And I'm talking, when I'm referring to North Korea, I'm talking and referring to, uh, um, to amount uh, near 1.2 billion. And for the last year, it was already 600 million. So we are not talking about just slow, a low operation, low transaction. So in this context, it's vital that countries implement our standard quickly and effectively. But unfortunately, we have two problems to deal with that. Geographic gaps, first of all. We have been actively monitoring implementation of our standards since 2019 through mutual evaluation of individual countries and also through an annual survey uh, that we circulate to um, the 205 jurisdictions. Next week, we will be publishing our latest update on the state of global compliance, and the picture is mixed. Among the most advanced economies, about three quarters are at least largely compliant with the new standards for crypto. Also, most still have not implemented the so-called travel rule. However, looking globally, the picture is worse, as only a quarter of all countries are complying with the requirement, and many have not even begun work to regulate this sector. So this is a real concern because it's too easy for virtual asset activity to be conducted across international borders. Jurisdictions that fail to regulate virtual assets can potentially become safe havens for large-scale criminal and terrorist financing activity and sanctions evasion with spillovers into well-regulated jurisdictions. So recognizing that there is an urgent need to deal with poor global compliance and fill those geographic gaps, the FATF this week precisely has also adopted a roadmap to improve compliance. And as part of this roadmap, we will do different things. We will first identify materially important countries uh, which have the um, virtual asset service provider important uh, sector. We will provide support and assistance to those countries to help them begin to regulate and supervise this sector. But we will also take escalating measures for countries that have materially important virtual asset activity but fail to regulate. Our goal is indeed to give those countries early warning, know that they will be monitored as a priority, to target them with additional assistance and support to establish virtual asset service provider supervision, and to publish a table in 2024 that will show which country, countries are failing to regulate, to enable more prayer pressure with potentially further consequences for countries which show no progress. The second uh, challenge that we have is the one related to um, uh, decentralized finance and peer-to-peer, -peer, because our standards focus on regulating payment intermediaries such as banks and crypto exchanges. However, this model of supervision is difficult to apply in cases where transactions do not pass through an intermediary. So what we are doing for the time being is that we are working with the private sector and the authorities at the international level to analyze the risk that we are facing due to decentralized finance and peer-to-peer. -peer. And uh, based on the analysis of this risk, we are developing guidance uh, and we will continue to develop guidance and see if we need to adapt the standards. And I will pause there. Thank you very much. So many thanks. Uh, many thanks, uh, Violin. I think it's not often emphasized that FATAF was clearly like, the first standard yeah. setting body, sort of developing new standards or adjusting standards to the to crypto asset uh, provided, uh, crypto asset related service providers, if I'm not mistaken. So I think it's, um, it's, it's good because now we see that your emphasis is more on implementation. Yeah? And you are actually contributing to a sort of wide implementation of the standard you have already developed. Okay, well, let's move now to the Basel Committee. Uh, Neil, please. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Fernando. It's a pleasure to uh, participate in this panel on um, crypto assets and decentralized finance. The uh, topic is obviously uh, highly relevant uh, to the work of the Basel Committee uh, for several reasons. Uh, firstly, the development of crypto asset markets and DeFi uh, could have a significant impact on banks' business models, uh, particularly uh, if payment activity starts to migrate away from the banking sector. Secondly, the use of distributed ledgers and the tokenization of assets uh, while offering potential to improve the efficiency of the financial system uh, also creates challenges for banks and bank supervisors. Uh, this includes needing the expertise to understand the various technologies uh, and whether the new risks created by these technologies can be adequately uh, mitigated. Uh, and thirdly, uh, banks may have direct and indirect exposures to crypto assets that expose them uh, to the risk of losses. Uh, in general, banks' exposures to crypto assets remain very low. Uh, personally, I think that's a good thing. Uh, of the hundreds of banks that the committee collects data from, only a handful have uh, direct exposures to crypto assets. And those that do, their exposures are a very small uh, proportion of their balance sheets. Uh, having said that, banks continue to seek to get more involved in crypto assets and more broadly uh, experiment with blockchain technology. Uh, at the moment, much of this interest uh, by banks is with the objective of facilitating customer transactions uh, rather than actually out outright ownership uh, of crypto assets. Uh, but again, we have seen just recently, and Fernando referred to this, we've seen cases where banks uh, with large direct connections, for example, through taking deposits or providing other services have been adversely affected as the crypto-related entities that, that they were serving got into trouble. So given the potential for bank exposures uh, to crypto assets to grow significantly in the coming years, the, the Basel Committee has been working to develop an appropriate prudential uh, treatment of bank exposures to crypto assets, and I'm going to focus uh, the rest of my remarks on the crypto standard that we published in, in December last year. Um, let me start with a definition of crypto assets. So we use the same definition uh, as the FSB. Uh, so crypto assets are basically private digital assets that depend on cryptography and distributed ledger technology uh, or similar technologies. But within that very broad term, there's obviously a, a wide range of assets. Um, and potential future assets that we may not have seen um, that fall under this very broad uh, definition. Uh, and we're gonna use this term and often referring, uh, maybe we should be specific as to which, which part of the crypto assets we're actually referring to, but we can think of it in, uh, at one end of the spectrum, you have things like uh, Bitcoin, which are unbacked, or algorithmic stable coins, which are not very well backed. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, you have things like uh, tokenized bonds issued in jurisdictions uh, with legal regimes that ensure the holders of the tokens are, are entitled to the same cash flows as traditional bonds, so pure tokenization. And then in the middle, you have potentially a whole range of stable coins, uh, which depending on their characteristics, you could either think of them as being closer to the unbacked Bitcoins, or if they're properly backed, they could end up becoming uh, categorized more closely to traditional financial assets. So the framework we came up with that we published tries to cover this whole spectrum uh, of crypto assets. Um, it does so by requiring banks to essentially divide their crypto assets exposures into two broad groups, uh, what we refer to as group one uh, and group two using a set of classification conditions. Um, so basically when we developed the framework, we, we had this idea as are there things currently in place where we could just apply the Basel framework, and if so, under what conditions? And we came up with these conditions, and if crypto assets meet these conditions, then essentially uh, the Basel framework applies. If they don't meet these conditions, then we came up with this alternative uh, treatment, uh, which, is, which is quite conservative, and that's how we ended up with this group one, group two classifications. Um, the group one crypto assets include uh, tokenized traditional assets and stable coins uh, that are assessed to have adequate stabilization mechanisms. As I said, these will just be subject to uh, the general, general requirements based on the existing uh, Basel framework. So again, if you have uh, a bank holding a tokenized corporate bond and it meets all the conditions to be included in a group one asset, 
then the capital, tra uh, the capital treatment is the same as just holding uh, a non-tokenized uh, corporate bond. Any crypto asset that fails any of these conditions that we've put in place falls into group two, uh, and this would include any stable coin that's assessed not to be stable, and anything that's unbacked, such as Bitcoin, uh, and any algorithmic uh, stable coin. Um, and under the finalized uh, standard that we issued last year, the group two uh, crypto assets are subject to a very conservative treatment. In effect, they have to be fully covered. Any bank exposure has to be fully covered uh, with capital. Um, when the committee finalized the standard in December of last year, it also published uh, a list of topics that it would continue to review during the course of this year and next. Um, so there may or may not be additional refinements to the standard. Uh, let me just mention two, two elements that we're working on. Um, first, uh, I mentioned earlier that stable coins uh, that are assessed to have a reliable stabilization mechanism can be in group one. As part of this uh, test, uh, there are some elements that must be used in this assessment. For example, a redemption risk test must be met. And this test aims to ensure that the assets backing the stable coin are sufficient to ensure that they can be redeemed uh, at all times. So one area of work that's ongoing is we're, we're looking at whether we can flesh out in more detail uh, the kind of requirements that would be placed around these reserve assets. At the moment, it's kind of sort of high, high level general requirements and we're, we're looking at whether we should provide more detail. Uh, a second element in terms of assessing the stability of uh, stable coins is this issue of whether we should have statistical tests. In our initial consultation, we had a specific uh, statistical test to test whether the stable coin value uh, actually, you know, whether it was close enough to the par value that it uh, is pegged to. Uh, in the final consultation, we actually removed it. We didn't think at the time that they, they were reliable enough, but there is ongoing work to see if there are statistical tests that we think uh, could be useful. Um, secondly, uh, the way the current standard is written, it is highly unlikely that any crypto asset that uses a permissionless blockchain uh, can meet the requirement to be included in our group one classification. So in a sense, if it's on a permissionless blockchain, you can't apply the Basel framework. Uh, you need to apply this, uh, this new uh, approach, this group two approach. Um, however, as part of the agreement, when we published the standard last year, we agreed to examine permissionless blockchains in more detail and investigate whether the risk can be sufficiently mitigated uh, to allow for their uh, future inclusion. Um, and finally, the Basel Committee announced as part of its 2023-2024 work plan that we would be undertaking further work on banks as stablecoin issuers and banks as custodians of crypto assets. So there's also work planned uh, in those areas. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Fernando. Yeah. Okay, many thanks, uh, many thanks, Neil. We'll come back to some of the issues on which you are currently working to refine the, the, the publisher standard. So let's now move from potential policies in relation to banks' exposure to crypto assets to security markets. So, Martin, what are you doing now? Fern <laughs> <laughs> Fernando, many, th many thanks for the invitation to join this uh, uh, session on this extremely important topic that has taken a lot of our time recently. And coming over here, I was trying to think how best to explain our changing attitude to crypto over the years. And if you think of crypto as having developed in a set of phases or cycles, so if you look back at the beginning, back famously in 2008 and 2009, it was set up, okay, then you had a first, as I, as I see it, this is my own sort of informal history, uh, a first sort of wave or boom around the time Litecoin was established in 2011. They built up a few assets. Then you had another sort of crypto period in 2013, 2015, at the time Ethereum was founded, but also at the time that people discovered that Crypto was very good for sanctions busting and uh, very good for money laundering. That was a period that, that sort of uh, uh, drew to a lot of people's attention. But at that point, it wasn't particularly uh, impacting, frankly, on securities markets. But the next wave of crypto, which happened at the time of the ICO craze around 2017, 2018, the initial coin offering phase, that brought them into close relationship with, with uh, uh, securities markets. At that time, in effect, crypto was used to establish a sort of uh, 
shadow primary market for venture capital, if you give it a, a, a maybe too pompous a title for what was going on. Uh, but it drew our attention very quickly. We became extremely concerned about it at that time. Um, and we, at that time, set up networks of our members to exchange information to see how to deal with it and provided a toolkit to our members so they could try to challenge what was going on at that time. Now, in truth, I would say our efforts were of limited success at, in that period. Um, while a lot of those initial coin offerings had an ostensible narrative of we're launching such and such to do this or that, none of that was really true. They were actually really pyramid schemes and pyramid schemes have a shelf life. And the ICO craze died out, frankly, not because anything we were able to do as regulators, but because pyramid schemes have a shelf life and they die out after a period of time. So the ICO craze ended but it did impact a number of, of our members and a number of jurisdictions because at that time you first saw jurisdictions starting to develop uh, um, uh, regulatory frameworks. And a lot of the regulatory frameworks you saw emerging then were focused on primary markets and were focused on the vocabulary that emerged at the time of the ICO network, which was all talking about security tokens and payment tokens and utility tokens and, and so on. So you will see that still in the legislation of some jurisdictions that took initiatives at that time to try to deal with, with uh, crypto. But after that died, crypto, it seems to me, and it seems to us, I think, in Alaska, moved into a new phase. And that new phase was somewhat more complicated and somewhat different, and the key features were centralized international crypto trading platforms, stablecoin arrangements, and the beginning of uh, DeFi. And frankly, it was much more complicated and much closer to securities markets in terms of what they were doing and have been doing, because arguably we're still in that phase or are coming to the end of that phase at, at the moment. So we went through a period of assessment. We produced a number of reports uh, we produced a report in 2020 on crypto platforms. We produced a report on, on, in, on retail investors. And uh, we produced a report on stablecoin. And then we went on to produce a report, which frankly took some time to do because it is complicated what's happening in this space. We did a report on, on DeFi. And pulling all that information together, we moved into a new phase of work because it's at that point in time that IOSCO decided that we need to produce recommendations for how crypto should be regulated. And the first step in that was our work with CPMI to produce recommendations in relation to uh, uh, stable coins, and that came out in July 2022. And at the same time, we produced a roadmap promising to deliver uh, global recommendations in relation to how crypto should be uh, regulated when it comes to securities market, and we promised to live, deliver that by the end of 2023 in two uh, sections. One to deal with crypto and crypto trading platforms, and the second to deal with DeFi. So we have just published in May this year our recommendations as to how crypto should be regulated insofar as it's involved in securities markets. And we will complete that consultation before the end of the year. And we will also have published a separate document on the particular issues of, C of DeFi, and we hope to have completed that by the end of the year as well. So by the time you get to the end of 2023, we believe that we will have global standards in place recommending how crypto should be regulated insofar as they are a securities regulatory challenge. And then we will move on to the same sort of issues that Dylan has, uh, uh, which are about monitoring and implementation and how we get from a situation where we have global standards to one where we have countries around the world conforming to those standards. And that's a big challenge because not only back in 2018 at the time of ICO, but consistently since then, jurisdictions have taken initiatives. And as we look around our members, frankly, it's quite a patchwork at this, at this point in time where jurisdictions have got to. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, let's now move to the Financial Stability SSID Board. We have heard actually developments in the area of AML CFT, in the area of prudential regulation, securities uh, security regulation with them. We will, will actually listen more in relation to market infrastructures and payment systems. So the FSB has this broad mandate in which you have to look at financial stability issues more generally. 
So what are the areas in which you are focusing now from the financial stability point of view? And also you can say something about how you are trying to somewhat uh, coordinate or ensure that there is sufficient, sufficient consistency in what different standard setting bodies are actually doing at present. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you, Fernando. Thanks for inviting us to talk about our work. Uh, crypto assets, like Martin said, has been taking up a lot of time and mental energy in terms of thinking about what the next step should be. If I can just start with a, a big picture sort of framework, which I think you're hearing from each of us, I just want to sort of maybe put it into my own words, which is I think there's three things that we probably are all trying to do. You've heard a lot about us trying to agree on minimum standards that can be applied globally. And that's a lot of what you've heard is us working on that. And Martin was just alluding to the second one, which is once we have those in place, we have to work to ensure that those are implemented consistently around the world. You can't have pockets where it's not implemented that just it just doesn't work at that point. And then the third piece is, I think you heard it a few times already, is this is an area that's just changing rapidly. Martin referred to three different phases. Uh, Neil referred to some changes and how hard it is to categorize things. We have to have a framework in place that ensures that we're going to cooperate, coordinate, and share information. Because once we put these standards in place, we can't just sit back and go, ah, it's done. We have to be talking to each other all the time. So that's the sort of big picture of what we've been working on. In focusing on that first part and agreeing on those standards, what has the FSB done? In 2020, we released our first set of recommendations, high-level recommendations, and they were focused on global stablecoin arrangements. Uh, in 2022, October of last year, we released a set of recommendations on crypto assets, activities, and markets, a broader set of crypto assets, I guess it's the way I would describe it. Again, a high level set of recommendations. <clears throat> if you look at them, and I'm not gonna, please don't ask me to quote all the recommendations. I could try, but I won't get the words right. So, uh, and I'm not gonna recite them to you now. But three principles that underlie those, and I think you've probably gotten a sense of this from others as well here. If it's the same activity and the same risk that's involved, the same regulation, should be involved. You can't say, well, we're different. If the same risk is there, it's got to be the same regulation. The technology, we've taken a neutral approach. So what is the underlying technology? Again, it goes back to that first principle. If it winds up with the same risk, I don't care what the technology is underneath. So we have been technology neutral in the recommendations that we put out. And then the FSB, because we're trying to sort of provide this coordinating envelope, our recommendations are high level. They're not gonna give you specific nitty gritty standards and guidance. That's what my colleagues here are working on. So they're high level and they're designed to be flexible. Different jurisdictions are gonna have different situations and circumstances into which they wanna apply those recommendations. So hopefully we, we've met those. So where are we? In October, 2022, we sent these two sets of recommendations, which are supposed to be a comprehensive set of recommendations for the supervision and uh, regulation of crypto assets. We sent them to the G20 as our draft set of recommendations, and we also released them for public consultation. So they were out for several months on that. The consultation was largely supportive, and we're about to release the revised final recommendations. They'll go to the G20, which is meeting in about two and a half weeks. The revisions, I think you'll see that most of the revisions reflect events that have taken place in crypto asset markets over the past six to nine months, things like FTX, for example. So you'll see some recommendations where you can very much see the link to what has happened there. So are we done? No, of course not. Uh, we're looking now to go deeper into some areas. For example, we now know that these large crypto conglomerates that perform multiple functions uh, have some risks that we weren't aware of. So we're doing some deep analytical dives to sort of assess the financial stability vulnerabilities. Not making policy there yet, not making recommendations there yet, but trying to understand them better. And we're starting the discussions on, okay, we've put out our recommendations, at least in a couple of weeks. So next week, we're gonna have a rec uh, discussion of how are we going to ensure that these get implemented consistently. The FSB has some reach, you know, Martin has a different membership, Neil has a different membership, we all have different membership. How are we gonna work towards that? Because if there are pockets that don't implement it consistently, that's where the firms are gonna go. And we've seen with, with events already that that's just not a good outcome. And then we have committed to assessing 
the implementation by the end of 2025, the assess assessment of the implementation of our recommendations by the end of 2025. So we're going to let people put things in place, and then we're going to take some action. And I'll stop there. OK, many thanks. Um, OK, Takeshi, you are just one in the first round. Thank of you, Fernando. Uh, I'd like to also thank for the invitation to, to this panel. Uh, and then uh, it, it's a pleasure to be with uh, uh, other fellow uh, stand setters uh, uh, with whom uh, we, we work quite a lot. Uh, so uh, because of the nature of the, the stable coins uh, industry. So and then uh, as Fernando also mentioned, uh, I'm stepping in for Tara Rice, uh, head of a uh, CPMI secretariat, uh, and the apologies for this uh, last minute change. And then. That th this topic is very timely uh, and then also won't uh, go away uh, easily or quickly because uh, the crypto industry you know, uh, has experienced uh, several setbacks uh, since the Bitcoin was launched in 20, uh, 2009 or eight, And then you know, they always come back uh, with, in a new guise and also with new buzzwords like uh, a smart contract or atomic settlement or uh, what have you. Uh, so global regulatory community cannot really just ignore or let the industry die down or burn out. Uh, so, so the topic will be with us uh, for for uh, you know for the future. And then, but th let me just uh, uh, say a few words about the CPMI. Um, the CPMI is a BIS committee uh, of uh, central banks, and the broadly uh, speaking, we have two sets of mandates, which has actually some implication uh, for how we approach to stable coins and cryptos. Firstly, we are standard setter uh, in the payments uh, and also clearing and settlements. And we work uh, jointly uh, with IOSCO um, and then we issued uh, jointly the principles for financial market infrastructures in 2012, uh, PFMI. And then secondly, we are forum of uh, central banks where we uh, discuss and uh, promote or uh, take action to improve payments in real world uh, uh, as uh, operators of payment systems, uh, because central banks operate uh, payment systems. And also, although you know, we also, they also supervise, uh, oversee payment systems and clearing systems, uh, clearing houses and the other FMIs, but uh, w w they, operate uh, you know the uh, uh, payment systems which is actually a bit unique uh, to CPMI in contrast to the other standard setting bodies and then that's actually leads to the uh, you know uh, to, to uh, uh, you know the sort of approach the uh, approach to stable coins first we have been reviewing our standards uh, in light of new challenges arising from stable coins and providing additional guidance to FMI a PFMI where needed at the same time, we have been fostering uh, private sector, public sector efforts to improve cross-border payments, for example. And we are exploring uh, improvements in existing uh, uh, payment systems. And also, we are exploring the post potential of uh, CBDCs uh, for cross-border payments. And the, the, as the uh, standard setting body, uh, as the most significant piece of uh, work, on stablecoins so far is the this uh, uh, guidance on application of our standards PFMI to systemically important stablecoin arrangements, which we published uh, 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 last year. And then I can talk a bit about more about this guidance later in this panel. But the key message of this guidance is again, uh, if a stablecoin arrangement performs the function of transferring uh, stablecoins for payments, as traditional payment systems would do. Uh, then, and then it's uh, considered as systemically important by uh, relevant authorities. Then the PFMI should apply, and also such a uh, stable arrangements should uh, comply with all relevant principles of the PFMI. And this is again clear uh, manifestation of this uh, first principle: uh, the uh, same activity, same risk, and the same regulatory outcome. And then, however, uh, in light of uh, several novel features of uh, stablecoin arrangements, uh, such as use of DLT, uh, the guidance provides uh, clarifications as to how certain uh, principles could be observed by these uh, stablecoin arrangements. And alongside uh, such CPMI, 
work, uh, your school work, the CPMI uh, continues to engage with the FSB, especially on their uh, ongoing work on the uh, FSB recommendations for global stable coins. And the, also we continue to work together with the FSB uh, on their work on the uh, DeFi and the conglomerates, uh, crypto conglomerates. And there's also a need for cross-border, uh, cross cross-sectoral cooperation and coordination between the relevant starting setting bodies together with the Basel Committee and the EOSCO. We have worked to identify and assess uh, possible differences and the level of consistency and the interdependencies across standard setting work frameworks. And then F uh, CPMI is further exploring issues related to tokenization of money in general, and we will be in investigating uh, potential benefits, risks, and challenges for central banks. Let me now turn uh, to the other you know, mandate of, of, of the committee as a forum of central bank uh, as a payment system operators and the catalyst for uh, improving payments. And stable coins may have shortcomings in the aspects that go beyond the, the scope of the PFMI, such as uh, you know, ML, CFTC uh, uh, issues, and our data privacy and consumer protection competition. And further, stable coins could lead to a fragmented and fragile monetary system. So here that we are keenly aware that the regulation, supervision, or oversight of uh, stable coins arrangements alone may not uh, achieve what we want to achieve. So uh, regulatory efforts on stable coins should be complemented by private and public sector efforts to improve existing, uh, again, existing payment in, uh, systems and also to explore CBDCs. And this is exactly where our second uh, mandate uh, comes into play. And then I personally see that, uh, although it was abundant, uh, the uh, Libra project uh, was a wake up call to us, um, the, uh, to the central bank community, highlighting urgent need for uh, improving cross-border payments. So we need to provide credible uh, options uh, if we want to keep diverse and competing uh, payment choices. And the cross-border payments program has moved from stock taking uh, phase to making uh, the phase of making tangible changes in real world. And we will continue to work with the FSB and the FATF uh, and then other international bodies such as the IMF or World Bank uh, toward a goal to improve uh, cross-border payments. And lastly, the F uh, CPMI in this context has been collaborating closely with the BIS Innovation Hub. Uh, there's scope to explore uh, further areas for collaboration, benefiting, benefiting from the synergies between uh, the Hub and uh, especially their expertise in technology and the CPMI expertise in policy issues. And our shared interest in interlinking fast payment systems, for example, is in uh, case in point. And the uh, BIS Innovation have uh, worked on the project Nexus to interlink uh, fast payment systems across jurisdictions. And we, CPMI, has been working to, uh, uh, as part of the Indian G20 presidency to, to think about uh, how the oversight, oversight and the governance framework for such interlinking uh, systems uh, should be, uh, would be look like. Um, let me stop here. Thank you. Okay, many thanks, Takeshi, and thank you very much for intervention, in particular for stressing uh, all the efforts you are making in trying to ensure consistency across the world done by different standard setting bodies. Also, John referred to that. There is one area that, uh, that uh, Martin mentioned, which is his vocabulary. I'm not sure whether we have achieved actually sort of common voc voc vocabulary when we talk about uh, uh, work done in different policy domains. Okay, so let's now uh, go back to, to VLN. I think you mentioned very much the work you are doing now in the area of implementation. You mentioned also uh, the issue of the travel, the famous travel, travel rule, which is a core part of your, of your standards. I think that people are all aware that uh, some crypto asset intermediaries are finding actually problems to comply with the travel rule. The idea that they are supposed actually to get accurate information about the originator and the beneficiary of different transactions to be able to transfer this information to the next intermediary. Um, this is challenging. Sometimes people are complaining that they don't have actually 
a proper technical instrument to that, other stages very costly, particularly smaller intermediaries. So how do you see actually the implementation of the, of the travel rule? What type of advice you could provide to, to those guys who are now complaining about it? Okay. <laughs> so I will start by saying that uh, it's one of the main challenges that we have. Uh, but at the same time, we are convinced that uh, we have to work on it and to work on it uh, in a public-private partnership uh, as it is uh, a key principle, the travel rule, to ensure payment transparency. And of course, when we are talking of AML CFT measure without payment transparency, we can't do our job. And financial institutions, service provider, uh, crypto asset uh, provider can't do their job also. Um, so, um, in our view, it's not negotiable. So that's a strong part of our statement. But having said that, we, all, we are also convinced that now that we are in an evolving environment as regard technologies, we have the possibility to work with uh, other authorities and to work with the private sector to enable these travel rules to really being implemented. Um, and that's what we are observing. And this travel rule, what is important is also ensuring transparency of payment is important for also the integrity and the security of the payment. So that it goes beyond the HML CFT purposes. That's the first thing. Secondly, we are perfectly conscious that uh, we have a challenge, which is not only the cost, but the fact that we have to ensure compatibility consist, uh, compatibility with another rule, which is very important, which is the right for a customer to have privacy. So customer protection on one hand and AML CFT rules to implement on the other hand. So once again, um, given the discussion that we have with, um, with the private sector and, and in particular a large part of the industry, we think that there is a possibility to develop a solution that will make it possible to implement uh, efficiently uh, the, the travel rule. Um, that's what we observe. Um, and we are observing good progress at the national level. But there is a, a second challenge, which is we are talking about something which by nature can be cross-border. So that's the challenge. And I think that's the most important challenge that we are facing, not the technology at the national level, not the technology that can be the solutions that can be developed at the national level, but this question of interoperability and the fact that we have something which is coordinated as a, a framework at the international level. Because if you have a virtual asset service provider subject to rules on one side, sending the money to another country where the rules are different or where the rules don't exist, that's where you have the challenge. Because they are obliged to, to apply rules and they can oblige just one leg of the rule, not the other one. That, uh, meaning that they don't have access to the information related to the beneficiary, for example. So that's where um, it's really important that we continue to coordinate among the authorities and that we continue to work in a quite uh, innovative way with the private sector. We can't, con we can't work with, uh, with virtual asset service provider as we uh, have been working with the banks and financial sector, traditional, traditional financial sector. Why? Because the first thing that we have to do is to convince these uh, new actors that yes, there is an added value to be supervised and to implement certain rules. Why is there an added value? Because it will help them also to develop sustainable activity. And uh, it's good for the integrity of their business. So that's what they have to understand. So what we have done at the level of the FATF, which was, quite, which was quite innovative for the FATF at least, is that from the very beginning we have worked with the industry to test also the possibility of our standards. Though when we have established our standard, we, we felt stronger because as we have worked with the industry, the industry couldn't say your standard is not applicable. So that's also something which is important and the lesson which is very important to continue also to, uh, to promote. And we have what we call uh, within the FATF a virtual asset contact group where we meet on a very regular basis with a different component of the industry uh, working on new, te new technology for two reasons. To be able to 
assess the evolution of, the evolution of, the, you know, of the technologies, discuss the challenges, discuss the obstacles, but also share experiences about the solutions. So that's something which is really, really good and really positive uh, within the AML CFT, uh, CFT world. Though, having said that, we still have to do that at the international level among authorities. So, and so that we can put in place a travel rule which is consistently, in, which is implemented in a consistent manner. So my colleague from CPMI, my colleague from uh, the FSB uh, are referring to the fact that we are working together because yes, we are not, we, we can't work on our own and just say, okay, IML CFT, that's crucial. Yes, it's true, it's crucial, but that's not uh, everything. We have to work with the, with the FSB, with CPMI, because also this question of crypto asset and travel route, rule, it goes beyond crypto. It's, uh, it's, it has to be implemented for all cross-border payments. So we are closely working now with the FSB to see how we can put in place indeed solutions that work and work you know, around the world in, and have uh, and are implemented uh, consistent, uh, in a consistent manner. And it will all, the fact that we work with other authorities and the fact that we are working also with the private sector closely help us to understand the risk, how the risk evolves, and help us to adapt our standards or adapt the, our guidance. And that's something which is very important, is the capacity for an international organization, or also at the national level, to be able to adapt quickly our guidance or standards, because we are in an evolving environment and our standards can be rapidly updated. So that's something that we have in mind and we try to, to, to promote. Having said that, I'm put there. Okay, thank you very much for your reassuring words. Um, let's move now to, to, to Neil. I mean, you mentioned before that uh, the committee is now exploring possible refinements of the published uh, standard. They're looking at uh, stable coins arrangement. And also you mentioned these this, um, crypto assets which are issued in permissionless distributed, uh, distributed layers. Um, I understand that the, the issue is to identify whether they are sufficiently powerful risk mitigating devices that could actually be used in order to eventually move something which is not group two to group one. I know that you're working on this. Uh, I don't want you to preempt actually the conclusions of the, of the work, mm -hmm. but maybe you can tell us a little bit more about uh, where you stand right now in relation to this, to this matter. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you, Fernando. Uh, you've picked one of the most uh, complex topics in this in this whole area, so thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, but you're right. I mean, the treatment of permissionless blockchains is is a key topic of debate uh, in relation uh, to the crypto standard. So let me start again uh, with a definition, because there are there are different uh, definitions that have been used. Um, some use the term permissioned and permissionless. Uh, to refer to the users uh, of a blockchain, that is whether there are any constraints uh, on who can initiate and receive transactions on the ledger. Uh, that's an important issue, uh, but it's not what we have in mind uh, when we refer to permissionless uh, blockchains. Uh, so rather, what we mean when we refer to permissionless blockchains are distributed ledgers that do not limit who can participate in the consensus process to actually validate the transactions uh, and the data. Uh, so that is, these are systems where anyone can act as a node, what they refer to as a node, uh, to, to validate these transactions. And these permissionless systems are sometimes uh, referred to uh, as public ledgers. Um, the aim of the committee's review is to assess whether the risks uh, posed by crypto assets that use these permissionless blockchains uh, whether these risks can actually be mitigated so that we can feel comfortable uh, in, in applying the Basel framework to assets on such uh, blockchains. At the moment, as I said, they cannot, they cannot be included uh, in our group one classification. Uh, the main reason for that is that one of the classification uh, conditions says that these nodes, whoever or whatever they are, uh, must be regulated and supervised or subject to appropriate uh, risk management standards. Uh, it's difficult to see uh, how such a requirement can be met uh, in a permissionless system uh, where anyone can act as a node uh, and consequently uh, it may not be possible to confirm uh, their identity. So if you start off with this system where there's a bunch of players somehow validating 
these transactions and the data, you don't know who they are. Uh, the question is, well, are there certain controls? Are there certain things that we could put in place uh, to address the risks that come up in this sort of framework? Uh, so let me run through some of the risks and then potentially some of the mitigants that uh, uh, are being discussed that could uh, uh, make people feel a bit more comfortable. Uh, three general types of risks. The first one is around governance, the second one around legal and compliance risk, uh, and the third one around the technology uh, itself. So starting with the governance, in many distributed networks, uh, these nodes must agree, and often it may not be very many of them, maybe a handful of people, uh, on any changes or upgrades uh, to the system. And even if this is just to address a known flaw in the system, uh, this process, this consensus process uh, can be quite lengthy uh, with final decisions taken in ways that are not transparent and it's not possible to establish whether the, the decision makers have any, have any uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, also, if there are any upgrades to the permissionless blockchain, um, they may occur through so-called forks. Um, if there's no agreement by all participants on the upgrade, then you could have this case where these uh, blockchains basically split in two, with one based on an old protocol and one based on the new protocol. So this may be fine in the crypto asset world, uh, in the unbacked crypto asset world. Um, but what happens, you know, if there's a fork on a blockchain that records the ownership of tokenized uh, traditional financial assets? It's it's not clear. Uh, tokens that represent ownership of real world assets, you simply can't just have them duplicated on, on two separate blockchains uh, if, there's, if there's a fork. Um, there's also the issue around the ability of node operators uh, to order transactions in such a way that they can front run uh, and then breach consumer protection rules. So th this is uh, uh, similar to the, the sort of front running we've seen in the, in the traditional financial system with uh, high speed trading. Um, the second main area of concern is around legal and compliance risk. Uh, and one aspect of this compliance with re uh, relates to uh, anti-money laundering and the countering of countering the financing of terrorism, so AML CTF. Uh, and many of these permissionless networks pseudonymize the identity of network members, who, which obviously complicates uh, any AML and CTF uh, compliance. Uh, there is an argument that open public ledgers may assist authorities in tracking the movements of assets on a blockchain between different addresses. Everything is basically the whole history is always there. Um, but it may not be possible to link the network addresses uh, to spe specific individuals. Uh, but even in cases where you can do that, where you can identify the sender and the recipient of an asset, it's still not clear that the fee derived from that transaction um, from validating the transaction on a permissionless blockchain, uh, you, you, can't, you can't be sure that it hasn't gone to somebody, for example, who's on a sanctions list. Uh, another aspect of legal risk relates to the topic of probabilistic settlement. Uh, and in most permissionless blockchains, there's the risk that uh, blocks of transactions that get added to the chain are revoked. Although I think over time this risk uh, uh, has reduced, but in general, we prefer systems where you can be sure about the, the, finan uh, the finality of uh, the transaction. And I guess more generally in legal risk in a distributed system, uh, the basic problem is, you know, who do you sue when something goes wrong? Uh, how are you going to settle disputes with unknown entities uh, involved in the process? Um, the third main category of risk that I wanted to touch on is technology risk, uh, and some of these have been discussed many times before. Uh, in permissionless systems, you have this problem uh, that they may be vulnerable to so-called 51% attacks, in which, ca in which there's some sort of coordinated effort uh, to put, fo put forward to control greater than 51% of the nodes in the systems, and then they then select which and how blocks are added uh, to the blockchain. There's a whole range of other, other potential vulnerabilities. Uh, there's experts in this room in the BIS Innovation Hub uh, that can explain them further. Uh, they have funny names, which I don't, and I don't really understand them, but if you want to, if you want to look further into them, there's things like uh, eclipse attacks, cyber attacks, self-mining attacks, and, and so on, but you can ask others. I, I, I won't pretend I know, I know what they mean. Um, 
anyway, so th those are sort of at a high level, some of the general risks that, that are being considered uh, as part of the committee's work. So, you know, fairly standard, I guess, if you think about it, governance, technology, legal risk. Um, the question then comes is like, can we actually mitigate these risks? I mean, I think there are definitely risks there. Uh, and there are various ideas as to how this uh, risk mitigation could take place. So let me give you a few ideas. The first one is you have, although you have a permissionless uh, blockchain, you could have a set of identified controllers that you know that are responsible for governing the network. Um, you, cr you could require an off-chain backup record of ownership to recover ownership after there's some sort of disruption or a cyber incident. Uh, you could require the creation of business continuity plans. Uh, you could come up with uh, technological solutions to ensure that mining, uh, mining fees or the fees generated only go to uh, whitelisted participants and, and so on and, and so on. Um, but I think as you do that, <laughs> essentially what you end up starting to do is replicate what's in traditional finance uh, by putting all these controls on the system uh, and then at some point you, you probably have to ask yourself what's, what's the point of this whole process. But uh, so anyway, without reaching any conclusion on what the outcome was, that's kind of the risk we're looking at and the risk mitigants and hopefully we'll, we'll reach a decision as to whether uh, assets on such blockchains can be incorporated into the Basel framework. Stop there, thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, thank you very much for your effort to sort of explain difficult concepts and funny with funny names, but we took last, your last words, and I won't repeat in terms of the possible outcome for um, these <coughs> discussions. Great, uh, so let's now move to, uh, to Martin. Um, of course, you have mentioned before the good work you, you are doing in the area of market integrity and uh, consumer protection, so very much in line with your, uh, with your mandate. There is an issue which, of course, has gained much relevance, basically after the the collapse of CTX, uh, which is this issue of uh, having here players performing different crypto asset related uh, functions that could arise some conflicts of interest that need to be controlled to have been doing work, in, work on this. So it would be great if you can share with us actually how far you are in, in sort of establishing the right controls for these conflicts of interest to be adequately, adequately, adequately managed. Thanks, Fernando. I guess an important piece of background is the way IOSCO sets global standards for securities markets is to say that we establish general principles, some, sometimes with detailed guidance supporting that, but the general principles are quite high level. And that's consistent with the fact that securities markets around the world are actually regulated in quite different ways. Uh, and what we do as a standard setter is kind of say to jurisdictions, no matter how you regulate securities market, these are the standards of outcome that you need to uh, uh, achieve. And we've extended that approach now to crypto assets. So in that sense, it's not a one size fits all. It doesn't get down into the granular detail of all the kind of questions, for example, that Neil was in, in engaging with there. It rather, what we're aiming to do here is establish a benchmark of principles. If you are in breach of those, if you fall below those, then you're in the space that Guillaume was talking about earlier where you're a jurisdiction we have to worry about. And if you're above those, then perhaps you're not, uh, at least from a securities regulatory point of view. I should also say uh, we have focused on the market integrity questions and the investor protection questions and said something about the financial stability issues, but we haven't gone in detail into the uh, prudential regulation of these by analogy with the prudential regulation of investment firms. We have left that prudential question to one side for the moment. Uh, not that we don't think it's important, but we wanted to get the, the, the baseline points in place in relation to uh, those two core areas of market integrity and investor protection. So um, market innovation requires regulatory innovation. So our approach here is to say to our members, you have got to, in each jurisdiction, conduct an assessment of where you are because it's profoundly unclear uh, where the world is in relation to the securities-related regulation of crypto. And we're asking you to do a gap analysis between where you are and where you should be. And the conclusion of that could be, we're fine. There's a couple of jurisdictions that would put their hand up and say they think they're in the right place. 
The conclusion could be you just haven't put the right supervisory resources in yet. Your regulatory framework is okay, can actually deal with this, but for whatever reasons, maybe political pressure or others, you haven't put the supervisory resources in yet to actually tackle the problems. And the conclusion could be actually, you know, our regulatory framework and maybe our legal framework is flawed and needs to be fixed. And in that case, you either use regulatory powers that you have as a regulator, and many of our members do, to actually issue additional rules yourself, or you turn to your legislator and say, we need legislation because we've done the analysis and we're not up to standard. Um, so that's what we are recommending to our members, but the, the important thing is in the detail. So what we're asking them to do firstly is to conduct what we're calling an economic function test, to actually look and see to what extent crypto assets are being used for investment purposes for the kind of economic functions that are traditionally occur on securities markets. Now, um, that's a little bit different, for example, from the concept of a VASP that the FATF uses and under your scrutiny. I just sort of say, for example, securities markets, you're not interested in regulating classic cars or wine, let's say, even though occasionally classic cars or wine are used for investment purposes. But in neither case is that their primary purpose or function. So we're not interested in regulating them. If you were at the FATF, you might be interested in classic car sales, for example, because it can be used for money laundering purposes. We are not. So when we ask you the economic function test, we're asking, are they being used for the kind of economic functions that are used, that securities markets are used for? If they are being used in your jurisdiction for that function, then they should be regulated to an equivalent standard to every other asset that is used for those functions in your market. And we've then asked them to look and, at that under uh, six headings, conflicts of interest, abusive behavior, the cross-border regulatory cooperation, custody arrangements in your jurisdiction, the operational risks, and the uh, interaction with retail investors. So just very quickly on, on, on each of those, particularly on the most important one, which is conflicts of interest arising from vertical in integration. The FTX case was a very good illustration of the problems that arise here. Um, because you have businesses that have built up a business model over the last decade based upon the integration of functions, which classically and usually by legal or regulatory requirement are not allowed to be combined. Uh, and they're not allowed to be combined because they create on occasion unmanageable conflicts of interest. And there are lots of conflicts of interest in securities activities that are allowed to be combined, but subject to various constraints on how they are managed. But we've got a degree of uh, integration in some of these businesses, and we have set this out in our recommendations, that regulators have to face up to the fact that some of these businesses, and potentially some quite large ones, may have conflicts of interest that are not capable of being mitigated. And the implication of that is that some of the largest businesses in this sector would need to be broken up and not operate on the basis on which they currently operate. And just as a sidebar observation, I personally never understood the apparent profit margins in some of these businesses. And the only way to understand it seems to be on the basis of um, exploiting conflicts of interest between combining different businesses together. So that governance question is a key one for our jurisdictions to look at. Secondly, order handling and trade disclosures seem to us to be uh, extremely important. And we're asking our jurisdictions to see what are the obligations that these firms are complying with or should be complying with or should be required to comply with in relation to the routing of client orders because a lot of the issues arise in relation to that area. And we've done a particular, uh, put a particular emphasis also on the, the listing of crypto assets, in other words, the creation of crypto assets in uh, uh, different jurisdictions. And um, so, for example, we've put an emphasis on the importance of public disclosure of token ownership concentrations and, and disclosure of conflicts of interest. If you turn to abusive behaviors, none of this will surprise you. Um, there are important questions for regulators around uh, the risk of fraud and market abuse in these, in these uh, 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 um, entities. And that's quite evident. An awful lot of the money that has been lost by investors over recent years has been lost as a result of simple fraud. 
Uh, market surveillance is one where there's a direct link to the FATF and what it's doing because there is a critical link in terms of being able to effectively surveil a market that you can identify who is doing what trading. And uh, cross-border risks is one that we place a lot of emphasis on. These are, it's an obvious thing to say, they are inherently cross-border businesses. They're radically different from any traditional securities products because they systematically have no home market. Their cross-border market is almost invariably their main market. And that's, very, that's quite unusual. And that means as a regulator, considering giving one of these entities a license, you have to take into account the fact that they are, by definition, trading from your jurisdiction into other jurisdictions as their primary activity with almost no home market. And that requires very significant additional cooperation between regulators, arguably of a type we've never seen before, or to a degree we've never seen before. Certainly, we run a, a system, which is one of the things we're proudest of, for the exchange of information between regulators to facilitate enforcement actions. And we, we, exchange, we arrange the exchange of five to 6,000 pieces of information in five, 6,000 different cases every year to facilitate that. In relation to crypto, we found many of our members have found it difficult to uh, find a legal basis for exchanging information in relation to crypto cases because of legal uncertainty in their jurisdictions. And we've issued additional recommendations in relation to that. But we think there's going to be more scope and need for innovation in relation to regulatory cooperation to deal with this issue. Um, I'll just emphasize as I come to the end the question of custody and client asset protection. If you look at the business models of a lot of these crypto trading platforms, um, critical to them is not to allow or facilitate any third party custody arrangements and not to allow any transparency in relation to the character of their custody arrangements. And that runs completely contrary to what I would call one of the core areas in which IOSCO has set out principles. So we set out in some detail how um, client money should be handled, segregation, disclosure of those arrangements, but also the question of securing client money and assets question of insolvency, which has become a very significant issue. What happens to the client assets in time periods of insolvency? And does your jurisdiction have appropriate legal arrangements to deal with insolvency and to deal with compensation for investors in the same way do you have a compensation for investors in other areas? I won't say anything on the last two areas, which are operational risk and uh, retail access, access uh, because they are quite obvious. But I would just say we are also working on a second document which will extend this analysis into the area of DeFi and actually provide guidance to our members in order to do the same analysis in relation to DeFi where a lot of additional issues arise. In particular, the question of um, um, governance and ensuring that um, not only does the principle of same activity, same risk, and same regulatory outcome apply for DeFi, but that you can identify and hold responsible key individuals on a cross-border basis who are the people who wrote the software that creates the impact in your jurisdiction. And that, it seems to me, is a huge challenge for all of us to actually achieve that outcome. Okay, many thanks for this. I think uh, your remarks in particular to the need of this cross-border cooperation, I think it's essential, as you said, but also I just because they see the body which is well positioned for this, right? I mean, it has its tradition of developing this multilateral memorandum of understanding that could what? Yes, I, I think we are well placed to actually promote this. I, I think though we all have to uh, realize that you can't have cross -border, effective cross-border cooperation without similarity of standards across jurisdictions. If I have a different approach to crypto than you do, and I try to cooperate with you in regulating uh, a crypto entity, we will not succeed because we don't have the similar standards. That's the core issue. But you're also well placed to develop these common standards. So. That's the idea. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, let's move now to, to, to John and particularly the report that you published uh, recently on, on DeFi. If I, if I remember from reading the report, I understand your, your point is that at present, DeFi is not a major risk for financial stability, but still that you see in DeFi you know, the same type of risks that you also see in the traditional 
financial, financial system in terms of leverage and liquidity and maturity transformation and so on. And therefore, you conclude that you need actually to monitor very carefully what is going on, to try to get more data, more information, which is not, is not a straight, uh, a straightforward. But also, uh, you will not exclude the need to eventually modify some the regulatory perimeter to fully incorporate this type of activity. I will be interested in you expanding a little bit on this report, but I think that is very important, in particular, whether you see any specific uh, dimensions in which those regulatory perimeters could be adjusted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let me say a few words on, on what we've done. You've just highlighted it. And let me say a few words on why I think it is so difficult to take the next steps. And uh, then I'll say uh, the next steps that we are contemplating and thinking about right now. So I'm going to dodge your question a little bit, but uh, I try to give you a little bit of flavor there. So you're correct. In February, we released a report on the financial stability implications of decentralized finance. This was a, a report that we delivered to the G20, as you've highlighted. We highlighted that you know if you're performing the same activity as a traditional financial institution, and there's the same risk involved, then you know we should probably think about the same regulation and regulatory outcomes. We also highlighted that because this is at an early stage, and I'd say this is an offshoot of crypto in some sense, and it's you know a few years behind it, it's not as far along. I don't think it represents, at least at the time of the report, things are changing quickly. It did not represent a financial stability risk that was imminent and highly concerning. So what are the challenges to going from that to thinking about what we should do if it grows and becomes more prominent? I think there's a few things, and we highlighted these in the report, so I will just uh, re-emphasize them. First, it applies to crypto, it applies to DeFi. It is not a static thing. If you think that right now you can raise your hand and tell me what DeFi is and what the landscape looks like, great, let's talk afterwards, because I'd love you to explain it to me, because it's just constantly changing. New firms, new innovation, new activities, new things that we have never thought of before. Somebody out there is doing it which makes the challenge of monitoring it very hard because you don't even necessarily know what you should be looking for because something could be a new innovation you've never heard of. So one key challenge is we have to monitor it very carefully, but it's an elusive and constantly moving thing. Second is, you know, I think all of us, when we want to monitor something, we go out and grab the data. But for a DeFi firm, that data might be non-existent, right? They might, be a, they might have chosen intentionally to domicile in a place that doesn't require them to report anything. Or they are required to report, but they claim that they're not required to report, so they're reporting very little. Or I think what's most common is, you know, they have some information on their balance sheet, but it's just so far short of what I would find if I talked to Martin's firms and, you know, securities regulators or Neil's banks and what they would report. So you look at you know, this, this data you can hold in your hand and say, I'm supposed to understand your entire enterprise by this, whereas you know, I've got this for traditional financial institutions. So the data is just not there. So when you're talking about an industry that is changing and it doesn't have a lot of data, that makes the analysis of what we really care about very hard. From the FSB's perspective, we do monitor crypto assets. And what we're trying to do is sort of expand and enhance that monitoring to look at decentralized financial institutions and activities. Very hard, but we're trying to sort of push that in ways. And we're learning where the boundaries are and where we need to ask for more information. One area that's of particular interest is the interconnections that we see. Because when something bad happens someplace, I want to know where it's going to have spillover effects. So what are the interconnections between de decentralized financial institutions and activities and traditional finance? Because if it switches over to the traditional financial institutions or activities, I've got a big problem. Crypto is heavily integrated into most DeFi. So what are the connections there? We've seen in the past, crypto has had some issues, which has had some ripple effects. Tokens, tokenization, that's an increasingly important part of decentralized finance. So what are these interconnections? Can I measure them? Can I understand them? Can I see what the path of contagion will be if something happens? And then we've started to do work with the folks around the table on just measuring the exposure of traditional financial institutions, be they banks, insurance companies, market infrastructures, to decentralized financial activities. So I, I explained to you why this is hard. So what are we trying to do? 
So we're about to release the final recommendations for crypto assets and stable coins. So what we're asking ourselves right now is, can these be enhanced or augmented in some way so that these high level flexible recommendations could also apply to DeFi, which is a little bit pushing them a little bit further they were intended to go. So we're looking at that in ways we can do that. And I think you've heard a couple of things already that would probably fit into any sorts of revisions that we did. And then we are considering policy proposals. These things might be things like supervisory or regulatory requirements or recommendations around financial institution exposures. You know, it could be, you know, recommendations on limiting your exposure or on recording, reporting your exposure so that supervisors and regulators know what your exposure is. It could be uh, a similar sort of supervisory or regulatory requirement around your relationship, your traditional financial institution's relationship to the activities of DeFi. Are you providing them with activities and services? It could be custodial services. You could be serving as a trustee. It could be maybe you're engaging in financial transactions to them. So should we be collecting that data? Now, these first couple have been sort of from the perspective of the already supervised and regulated sectors and sort of looking at what our exposures are. But then the last option would be should the DeFi sector be brought into the regulatory perimeter? That would be a, a bigger step. But again, you've heard it said so many times, I apologize, but if it's the same activity and the same risk, shouldn't it have the same regulatory outcome or regulation? Um, I would not look for recommendations from the FSB this year, but I would say in 2024, we will probably be able to put out our enhanced recommendations for crypto assets or a separate set of recommendations. And that's about where we are. And I think you've heard enough of this. So I'm going to stop there and I'm happy to answer more questions. Okay, uh, very good. Uh, interesting. I think a good uh, combination of the difficulty sector to move forward, but your determination to do it anyway. So this is, which is obviously quite reassuring. Uh, okay, let's go to Takeshi. To Takeshi now. Let's see if maybe maybe you, you can expand a little bit more on this work you have conducted with IOSCO on this uh, the application, right, of the principles for systemic infrastructures to to a stable coin to a stable coin arrangements. Um, of course, they basically it is that basically that you are a systemic stable coin arrangement. Um, and basically in line with this principle, same activity, same risk. I prefer same regulatory outcome, frankly speaking. It looks less conservative than just uh, same regulation. Um, basically, what you want actually, basically, those principles to be applied to, to, to stable coin arrangements. But also, you basically incorporate some elements like the need of these stable coins to be converted into fiat currency or standard liquid assets, not only in, in, in normal times, but also in stress situations. Um, so, it would be good actually to have more information about what you have known. And whether you have an idea about how implementation is going to be, I mean, how challenging implementation could be of these principles for high level considerations. Huh? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure if uh, this is a topic that you want to discuss uh, after 5 p.m. Uh, Saturday afternoon, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> let, let me try. Uh, but you, 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 Fernando, you described the, the core message of the guidance. Uh, very nicely and to the point. I think uh, if a stablecoin is used uh, as settlement asset for discharging financial obligation in a systemically important way, it should be subject to the same level of requirements that they, as those for money uh, used for such purposes. Um, so as you pointed out, timely conversion uh, at par into liquid assets is an essential element in this context, and uh, our requi requirements for settlement assets uh, are very demanding, and uh, we uh, clarify those requ uh, requirements in our guidance. And uh, because we, we did this, uh, because we have seen in the past that the, some financial uh, instruments such as MMFs uh, were used or perceived by investors as if uh, they were uh, you know, some form of money or bank deposits which promised basically intraday uh, timely redemption at par when they were actually not. Uh, you know, the, uh, however, we have also seen uh, huge uh, you know, liquidity management challenges uh, 
uh, with such uh, financial instruments uh, in stress times. And then also we have seen central banks had to intervene with emergency liquidity provision. So we, with this in mind, uh, we provided uh, uh, very you know, demanding uh, requirements in the, in the guidance so on uh, principle nine on money settlement. And there are several other uh, novel features of stable coins that may give rise, a rise to the other challenges which uh, uh, in the stable coins arrangement uh, encounter when seeking to comply with the PFMI. I, I give you three examples. First is the decentralized nature of operation and governance, and also automation, uh, such as use of smart contracts. So guidance uh, says that there should be a clear and direct lines of responsibility and accountability in governance. And the governance should allow for timely intervention in times of stress or in unforeseen uh, contingencies. And the second, uh, we, we talked about the use of DLT and issues related to settlement finality. So uh, the, like the FSB, uh, the, the PFMI take a technology neutral approach and then so we don't uh, really prescribe or prohibit use of certain technology as such but still the, the new technology may have an uh, impact uh, again on how to observe certain principles of PFMI. For example the use of a DLT may create a misalignment uh, between legal settlement finality and the state of leisure as uh, Ni was referring to and this could happen, for example, when a fork occurs. And there's also an issue of probabilistic uh, settlement in certain types of DLT solutions. So again, the guidance requires that the stable core arrangements should uh, first cl clearly define the point in time when settlement finality takes place. And then uh, the stable core arrangement should ensure there's a clear legal basis uh, to support such settlement finality and also they have to have a robust mechanism for preventing any misalignment between uh, the state of the leisure and then legal finality. But if it happens, uh, they need to ensure legal finality, once it has achieved, uh, is maintained regardless of the competing state of leisure. So very technical, but uh, this is very important concept to us uh, for uh, CPMI school. And then thirdly, uh, risks arising from interdependencies, uh, uh, and, and John uh, mentioned uh, several interdependencies uh, in uh, between, uh, you know, stable coins, crypto, and DeFi, and also with the traditional finance. Uh, and then we also see uh, there are lots of uh, interactions between the transfer function uh, on which we, we focus, but also the other functions such as issuance, redemption, custody and the uh, other functions which may be uh, related to tra trading or market making uh, and the other uh, activities in DeFi. And then also stable coins act as a sort of a, a substitute for fiat uh, currency uh, in a crypto uh, space. And then it acts also as a bridge uh, between the, the crypto world and the traditional finance through which uh, maybe risk might uh, propagate uh, when it happens. So we provide uh, some uh, requirements um, uh, in regarding a proper management of such uh, uh, risks arising from interdependencies. And then uh, building on this uh, stablecoin uh, guidance, uh, we are now looking into uh, uh, issues that may arise in so-called multiple uh, currency stablecoins. Uh, these include st stable coins uh, which are denominated in the basket of multiple currencies like uh, uh, Libra uh, 1.0 and then also uh, which may include uh, those uh, backed with the uh, reserve assets in multiple currencies and also the some arrangement where multiple stable coins are bundled together on a, and then offered on a single platform. So we are looking at the, these uh, you know, specific issues uh, uh, together with EOSCO. And then also uh, we, we worked on the application of PFMI expectations with, with respect to the uh, responsibilities of uh, re relevant authorities in the context of stable arrangement and supervision and oversight of these arrangements. In particular, how 
authorities should or could uh, uh, work together with the uh, uh, other authorities. And going forward, uh, with respect to the implementation, CPMI would be interested to see how authorities are adopting our guidance in their jurisdictions. And in this context, uh, we are also keen to work together with the FSB in relation to this, uh, the, the, your implementation of the, your recommendation on global stable coins. Thank you. Thank you, Takeshi. It was not that bad, you see? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> You're All right. still awake. I think, <laughs> I think has been a great exchange of views. I'm sure that uh, it has provided very helpful information to all of you. I wonder whether somebody in the audience would like to intervene, make comments. Yeah, that's the case. So let's start with uh, Yoshi Orda. Eh? Mm -hmm. Yoshikawa from OECD Insurance and Pension Committee. Actually, I'm, I'm sitting there for 20 years, so I'm just very much <laughs> curious what you are doing. And particularly, uh, what you have talking about crypto assets, uh, and also what, to Martin, you mentioned, this is by nature international, and by nature it's international cooperation is so important. And as you mentioned, rules of the game have to be common, otherwise we cannot cooperate each other. So and you have talked, all of you have talk, talking about uh, your own uh, standards. But I want to understand that maybe many of us would like to understand how you guys, you know, uh, interact with each other and uh, what's the rule of the game. Uh, for example, shadow banking, when we discussed, FSB create the overall picture and uh, each standard set uh, have its own role, banking, securities, and so on. So maybe John or somebody, could you provide us a little bit overall picture how this, you know, crypto assets internationally rule of the game is, you know, coordinated. And I assume that FSB have a sort of, you know, overall stability issues and the EOSCO, FMTI, or Big Basel Committee and uh, CPMI, how it's interlinked, you know, just to maybe to help us to understand overall picture a little bit, you know, how it interlinked, so that we can understand much better. Maybe what we should take doing. a couple of questions, and, then, and I think Atanasio is over there. Yeah. Thank you, Fernando. It's a, a, it's a very useful session, but also uh, raises some concerns uh, about uh, how uh, hard it is to catch up uh, with uh, with developments in this sector and the fact that. Uh, despite all of the efforts in the last uh, few years, we're, we're continuing to be behind. So I have a, 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 a question relating to the title, policy approaches. And, and I wonder, uh, in, in your collective wisdom, um, since the, the word consumer protection came up, uh, pyramid schemes uh, came up, uh, I wonder, are you satisfied that the central banking community is doing enough to uh, educate uh, consumers? Uh, uh, are we collectively doing enough in the broader community uh, on um, uh, uh, educating, uh, providing information, uh, financial literacy, which is really among the best ways we can protect against uh, pyramid schemes uh, and provide uh, uh, consumer protection? And if not, uh, uh, what are the next steps that we should, uh, that we should do that? It's an investment that, uh, that may actually help uh, alleviate many of the challenges I have. Let me offer a specific example again from the title. Um, uh, this session is about crypto assets. Uh, Fernando, you mentioned the vocabulary, but you know, it's, it's not a new issue. Are they really assets? I mean, why are we using the word crypto assets? Uh, in, depending on the language, uh, assets give a connotation of value. And uh, the question is uh, uh, whether we want to, uh, to be perpetuating that. Take a question over here and then I give the floor to speakers. I can continue afterwards. Huh? Hi, Mariwa. Mariwa Amiya is from the World Bank and thank you for very interesting discussion. Here it seems to me that this uh, area, the cross-border dimension is very important uh, even um, more important than, than in other standards, no? And when it comes to implementation, then uh, it may be a challenge because we need all the countries to advance at the same pace. 
when in some previous standards there has been the framework, there has been uh, different countries coming at different pace. So I wanted to, to hear from you first if you think that the cross-border dimension is more important than other standards, and if so, is how we ensure uh, implementation at the same time as for, for some, from so many countries as possible. Thank you. Okay, interesting questions about the interlinking between policy actions in different domains, about, uh, about education, the vocabulary, and, and the cross-border dimension. Who could like to intervene on these or related matters? I, I can answer on the first one, John. at least. Okay. Uh, all easy questions. We've got it all figured out, so it's, <laughs> it's, it's no problem whatsoever. So on uh, crypto assets and, and do we work together and how do we work together? I mean, so the first answer is I sit there and I call Martin and he yells at me and I yell at <laughs> nothing like that. Uh, um, the G20 did give us a coordinating role in crypto assets, so we've tried to exercise that role. One of the things that we have developed is a shared work plan on crypto assets and activities. So we are all talking together quite frequently about, okay, well, what is your committee doing? You know, okay, and so we're already starting on something like that. Can we work together? So there is an attempt to ensure that we are collectively not doing the same work, but also not leaving gaps. So it's not a perfect thing, but I think it is a, a mechanism that we're trying to do very well. Um, they're all members of the FSB. So when we decide on our work plan, they're all there to say, you know, we're actually already doing that. Okay, well, we'll, we'll try to, you know, just carve out this. So there's, there's that. And then I think when I talked about the recommendations that we issued, I think I said several times high level. And one of the reasons was we wanted to get the broad set. Martin's got a different mandate than Neil, than the Orlane, than, than Tara and the CPMI. So the idea was to get the broad set of categories and then have them do the detailed and more rigorous standard setting work for their mandates. So hopefully it works well. I mean, you know, Martin and Neil might, you know, grab me by the, the tie later and tell me all the things I've, we've done wrong, but we're, we're trying to do that well. Uh, I'll leave the other questions to other folks. Okay. Yeah, I mean, my, sorry. No, go ahead. Please, I just wanted to, to, to complement uh, that um, at the FATF level, what we have done, as we are not as integrated as uh, the, the FSB here, um, we, uh, we have invited the FSB, for example, to participate in our working group so that we can ensure the link between our more specific work, you know, and uh, the link with the broader picture so that we don't lose the broader picture when we are working only on the MACFT. And it's obvious on the cross-border payment also, we are working together, we, are part, we have uh, some of the action plan of the FSB are related to uh, the FATF, and we are trying to ensure consistency with our work and trying to also work at the same pace. Good, Neil? Yeah, no, I, I think the, you know, the cross-border, sorry, not the cross-border, but the, I guess the cross-sectoral question is a particularly difficult one in this case because it's not really c clear where a lot of these things sit to start with and they sort of move around and you're not, not, not quite sure uh, where things are. I mean, you know, from our perspective, we take, we start off from the, the Basel Committee perspective, it's very narrow. It says, okay, a bank has an exposure to a crypto asset, what's the treatment? So that's, that's very narrow. So there may be a stable coin or some crypto asset. Um, what's the exposure to that? It, it doesn't say anything about, you know, what defines a crypto asset or is something a stable coin outside the banking system. So that then gets into all the other standard setters uh, and the FSB. Uh, but the problem arises is that, so for example, when we're writing our standards, we're saying what we think is acceptable whether it's, a, let's say, a stable coin for a bank to give it a certain capital treatment. So we're writing what we think is appropriate. Then the other standard set is also doing the same from their own perspective, and the FSB is doing the same from the perspective of what if you know, a non-bank establishes <coughs> a stable coin for whatever purpose. Um, so we're all doing... S <laughs> things that are highly interrelated, but with a slightly different uh, perspective. Um, and 
you know, the best we can try and do is try and understand what each other's doing and sort of the different angles uh, that, that we're coming at. But I think in this case, it's, it's particularly difficult um, to address. Maybe I can address the question of assets. Why are these things called crypto assets? Um, uh, that's a good question because initially we didn't want to call them currencies, so we came up with the word <laughs> assets. And now maybe they're, I don't know, what do you want to call them now? Crypto liabilities maybe would be better. <laughs> but, uh, or just, uh, but even the word crypto, I mean, we use that word, but uh, it's so broad, uh, you know, everything from a tokenized asset to Bitcoin <laughs> to a, a stable coin. But uh, I, I don't know if there's a better term, but uh, I agree that they're, they're, they're not really assets. Uh, oh, sorry, we're, by saying they're assets, we're giving them, we're assuming they have, they have value. Uh, on the cross-border cooperation question, um, uh, I, I think you're right. That's, I, I don't see it as necessarily more important. I mean, you know, it's kind of the reason why the Basel Committee exists in the first place is, you know, banking is, is international. If you don't have cross-border cooperation, uh, you have a problem with an international level playing field and, you know, banking migrates to the, uh, otherwise migrates to the kind of the, the weakest link. Um, in this case, I think it's uh, it, it's just as important, but maybe it's a little bit more difficult uh, uh, to enforce. And you know, maybe it's it's also more important outside the Basel Committee uh, remit because this stuff can just you know originate anywhere and uh, and be and be global. Well, I'll stop there. Okay, thank you, Martin. Please. Just a few points. I mean, just to agree with John on the on the interlinkages. I I I think we're actually very well coordinated and it's we, we to the point where we're trying to coordinating timing of the issuing of documents and we're coordinating uh, uh, checking in that the kind of analysis we're doing is coming to the same conclusion we're making sure when we do our stuff that that we there's proper references there in the in to financial stability and look forward to the work that's coming out of the FSB on that so we're trying to make sure that coordination is there I think there is an ambiguity in the principle same risk, same activity, whatever, same regulatory outcome. I always get that principle wrong, but there, there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, a <laughs> there's an ambiguity in that, of course. And one of the things that we all find, I suspect, is we get lobbied by people in industry saying, you know, that principle, well, they should be regulated like I am because they're doing the same thing as me. And somebody else comes down and says, well, no, they're not doing the same thing as you. So, you know, there's a lot of dispute that's possible, disagreement within that principle. It's an aspiration, but we have to work it every day and iterate it to get to, get to, to, to the right position. I, I wanted to come to the uh, consumer question just for a moment because I think this is an absolutely critical question in relation to this sector because let's face it, this sector exists because people in the retail sector kept buying this product, if, if I use, can use that vocabulary for a second. Um, they voted with their, with their money, uh, to, and that's a challenge to, to all of us. And sometimes they acted very foolishly. Sometimes they lost large sums of money. And um, I talked about a pyramid scheme earlier. You know, there's a paradoxical logic of a pyramid scheme it's probably in principle very foolish to invest in a pyramid scheme. But it doesn't seem that foolish if you're the one who got in and got out before the pyramid scheme collapsed. <laughs> it can actually seem like it was a great idea and you were really clever. So there's, there's a problem with consumer education uh, when we come along and tell people it's very foolish to invest in pyramid schemes, for example which it is, as a general rule, very foolish for people to invest in pyramid schemes. So we have a challenge, I think, in relation to consumer education, because some of the things, messages we have to deliver will be treated with skepticism by people who think they know better and may even end up with a lot of money in their pockets to supposedly prove they know better. And the second problem we have that's specific to securities markets is while securities markets are used for investment, and I talked about the economic function of investment earlier, they are occasionally at the margins also used for gambling. And there's a, a, a fluid boundary line between investment and gambling in relation to, to uh, securities markets. And we have a big problem, which in the banking sector has just seen, I think, in, recent, in relation to depositors, but technology reduces the frictions for people to move in and out of particular products. And we've seen that as being one of the main reasons why people have moved into and wanted to move into crypto 
because they like the fact that you can get in easy, you don't have to do any lots of checks, it doesn't take days to get it done. And if we're talking about consumer behavior, that's a big part of consumer behavior that we all have to, have to wrestle with. One of the things we've said in our recommendations is there should be, um, in every jurisdiction, appropriateness and suitability requirements for any intermediary who's involved in providing uh, uh, crypto to, uh, to retail clients. In other words, the same kind of requirements that require in relation to other assets. And if you do that, it changes the whole framework in which the, the retail investor engagement with these assets is dealt with. So uh, on the, uh, cr the uh, news point about uh, cross-sectoral uh, cooperation, I think uh, I really agree. Uh, the risk of uh, regulatory arbitrage is really, really real in this space. And then, you know, we, when we try to uh, apply our standards, uh, you know, PayFMI as a payment system to uh, stable coin arrangement, they might say, no, no, we are not the payment systems. Uh, we are used for investment. Then we, 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 when we try to apply our standards as a security settlement system, no, no, we are something else. Uh, so they are really elusive. Uh, so we need to be very, really, very really clever uh, in devising uh, you know, standards. And then uh, I think uh, Martin mentioned the, the, the focus on economic function. That's, the, I think, the very imp useful way to look at the, the risk and then uh, uh, how to manage the, the risk of regulatory arbitrage. And then on the uh, coordination among uh, standard setting bodies and the FSB, by the amount of I, uh, time I spend uh, in my day job, I can certainly confirm that we, we are well coordinated. And, uh, <laughs> and then uh, the, the implementation monitoring, uh, that's uh, the next, uh, I think, uh, thing uh, we need to think about. But the, I think it's very difficult uh, as uh, you know, jurisdictions are moving and then introducing uh, their legislation. I think uh, we can think about uh, sort of a stepped approach. First, look at the, uh, looking at the whether jurisdictions uh, have adopted uh, legislation, regulatory frameworks to, to really incorporate uh, international standards. Then we can move on to, the, to check the consistency between uh, the standards and the jurisdictional uh, implementation. And then, Finally, we should uh, also look at the implementation by, at the level of uh, individual crypto uh, or, or stablecoin arrangements. Uh, that's the most important, but the very difficult, challenging uh, work. But uh, we can start uh, from the, the level one, so to say, uh, implementation, and then move on to the, to the, the next uh, level uh, as the jurisdictions move also forward. Okay, thanks a lot. I appreciate. Uh all the messages you are conveying in terms of the efforts you are making in cooperating and coordinating and trying to make sure there are no unattended gaps here and there. Uh, but going back to the issue about the vocabulary, of course, uh, I agree. I mean, the term asset for, for a Bitcoin, I think, that's not, I mean, that's not fly. I mean, this is, this is not an asset, right? But more important than, than the term that you decide to use, it's really good actually to have the same term used with the same definition by your standard setting bodies. And this is not really quite the case yet. I hope, you, I hope we, we, we agree on this. There are a number of uh, examples here. I mean, the definition of digital assets or the crypto asset is not the same across all different standard setting bodies. You guys, from here to here, you openly talk about the stable coins. But the lady in the corner basically would like to call it so-called stable coin. Not the stable <laughs> coin. Or, or the term, or the term unbacked uh, crypto assets. I think it's only Basel Committee using this term, at least in, yes. in the official, official yeah. documents. Mm -hmm. So it's really good, actually, just to, to try to make, some, to make an effort, an extra effort, <laughs> or at least trying actually to agree on common definition. That would help a lot, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, maybe more questions here, uh, over there, please. Yep. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Moses Pelero from Botswana. Uh, but first of all, just to acknowledge these rich uh, discussions, and I thank you, FSI, for putting this together. Really, really appreciate it. I think the question of global leadership on the issue, I think, has been addressed. 
though we remain fragmented, but at least the coordination that you are talking about, I think, should help. But, you know, if you think about that and, and going to the national levels, that too, in terms of institutional arrangements of who does what, also gets very complicated. And maybe just a thought in terms of what you're thinking of. The other one is, is, is the, the economics of regulations. You know, I, I, I'm worried about sometimes that because we are regulators, standard setters, and so forth, anything that moves, we think we are the right people to, to look after it without asking the why. Why regulate? And, and, and when, you know, I was worried actually at, at the beginning, so the way sometimes these things were, were being taken. And so I think, you know, the, complica the complications that are coming right now seems that we haven't invested enough on understanding the economics of the regulations and vis-a-vis -vis market failures and, and so forth. And particularly the question of public costs versus private costs. I mean, you talk about foolish people that <laughs> do what they are. And so I think uh, the, the, clearly the, the Financial Stability Board is, looks like uh, the right people. But the other one is the traditions in terms of, of, of super regulation and supervision. I mean, if you take the contrast between FSB, Basel Committee, and so forth, and FATF, I mean, clearly two different things. You know, in, in the case of Basel Committee, in terms of the FSB, you see a principle-based approach. With FATF, it's rule-based. I, I don't know, I mean, you know. So in, in, in my jurisdiction, for example, 75% of our time today is is all about AML, CFT, and so forth. As we are thinking about that, then the crypto and virtual assets, and we spent nine months of the year last year, you know, revising legislation on things that we don't understand. Because <laughs> FATF says you should do it. Otherwise, and so what FATF has done now is fragmented us more. So there are jurisdictions now that are gray listed and blacklisted, uh, and and those that are not, and so and and it raises all kinds of complications. So these traditions of principle-based approaches, proportionality, risk, you know, you know, looking at what really matters for people, I think is going to be very very important. So I was just trying to say, you know, there are also good and bad approaches. And I liked the, the, the Martin's approach in terms of what, is, what they are thinking about in terms of market integrity, investor protection, and, 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 and not looking at the products themselves. I think it's very, very important. But, uh, you know, in, in the developing world, we are overwhelmed by, by some of the approaches. People are already implementing what they don't know. I mean, you know, FSB is still coming, and, and there are rules that are, legislation is being changed across the globe now to, 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 to accommodate these things. And so I'm just trying to say, let's, let's uh, be cautious. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, may one or two, and then we close. Yes, gentlemen over there. Thank you, Chair. I'm from Nepal. <coughs> First of all, thank you for this interaction, uh, the policy approaches <coughs> shared by all standards set today. Whatever, whatever the, be the name given for these assets, whether it's assets or liability, whether crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, stable coin, whatever it is, the underlying risk associated with, with these assets <coughs> are far much more than the mitigating measure we are adopting or we are prescribing so far. Especially the country like ours, small economy, where the <coughs> foreign exchange is under the control regime, we have a huge thread with respect to our external sector due to this type of transaction. Whether we, we mention it as a sets or not, the, the innovator themselves are trying to use these assets as a medium of exchange. 
and as a means for settlement. So there is huge risk for the monetary management as well. At the same time, whether we facilitate or we have a direct uh, investment opportunity towards bank, we'll have a huge uh, risk towards financial stability. So my, it is not my question, in fact, when submission to the global standard setter, including the IMF, that we are country like us, we are banning these assets so far in our country, considering that the mitigating measure are far below and the risk are far high. So we are banning so far. My submission is that let's have this option, at least for the time being for the country like us, to continue our prohibition, to continue our ban on such assets. The technology they use, the complexities it has, will may bring certain disaster to our economy. That's mm -hmm. why you, you, while devising your guidelines, your standards, please allow us to have this option to continue ban on these assets. This is my submission. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we are going to close here the, the session. Let me now give one minute to each of the panelists. Now we are going to go in the reverse order. Takeshi will go first and then you wrap up. So please, Takeshi, yeah. one minute. To say just just one word. Our journey continues. <laughs> <laughs> you know, our work okay. continues. I think uh, th there's a clear need for, for us to work harder and then you know, uh, with a resolved uh, uh, effort. Great. John? Mm -hmm. Uh, a few comments, just that uh, the FSB recommendations are very high level and they're designed to be flexible to meet different countries' uh, various needs. I don't think, for example, a ban is out of the question given the recommendations. It says you should look at, you know, do the authorities have the correct power? And one of those powers can be to ban, right? So, I mean, uh, hopefully they are high level so that it incorporates what everybody here is trying to do, but also the flexibility. If I'm wrong, you know, uh, Moses, we, we met each other at the regional consultative group. That's why I go to those groups to, to hear those things and to hear the feedback to so make sure that we're putting them the right way. Thanks. Your I, turn. I mm -hmm. would agree with that. Uh, I don't think there's anything in what we're writing that prevents a jurisdiction deciding to ban this product. It's if you don't ban it, that only if you don't ban it can it become a significant source of uh, location for investment in your jurisdiction. If you decide to ban it because of the payment functionality that is linked to it, it seems to me a jurisdictional choice and entirely legitimate. And just regard to the question of the costs of this, one of the reasons why we started with an economic function test is because our 38 principles are based upon decades of experience of what can go wrong. We've learned by experience that the cost is excessive in certain areas if you don't regulate. So having justified regulation on the basis of decades of experience, we're saying apply that experience, don't waste it, apply that experience to crypto and regulate it to the same extent and in the same way. But all that leaves us, I think, and my parting thought from this, from this session is we all face a huge challenge going forward in achieving a, a global transition to common uh, approaches to dealing with this. It's going to be really difficult, particularly since it is morphing and changing even as we are regulating. And so many of us have jurisdictions which regulate for a stable pattern of activities, but you're dealing with a dynamic and changing pattern of activities here. At the same time as we are about to publish our, our uh, document, our DeFi recommendations, we have to update a document that we published a year ago, just a year ago, on what the DeFi market looks like because it has changed so much even in that year. That's an incredible challenge. Good, Martin. Thank you, Neil. Yeah, I totally agree on, on, on the question of banning. It's Banning is perfectly consistent with the, the Basel framework. So if you ban it, go for it. No problem from our side. There are a number of Basel committee member countries that take that approach. I think we even mentioned that in the standards. So. Uh, but, but, uh, but banning is regulating, Moses, in my, in my pers perspective. So I think there is still a need uh, to regulate, whether you ban or have something more complicated. To me, that's, that's the same thing. And you need the, the reason we need regulation is because these things are, well, substitutes 
potentially for money, for, for payments, they're potentially assets that other financial institutions will hold. And as soon as they do that, you need to say, well, what is the treatment? What is the regulatory treatment? So I don't think we can get away from regulating in, in some way, uh, but uh, banning for the reasons you suggested, perfectly fine. Okay, so, Yolanda, please. So let me finish with um, uh, the following words. Uh, first of all, I think the same for the FATF, banning is possible um, based on the fact that the country has um, carried out a risk assessment. And uh, what is really important is that uh, FATF principle are risk-based and not principle-based so, uh, or rule-based. And, and we take into account the size, the size of the economy the size of the country, the exposure to risk, and that's important that the country is aware of the size of uh, the exposure to risk. So that's why one of the requirements from the FATF, it's true, it's to carry out a national risk assessment, which is the basis afterwards to assess the situation of the country towards the FATF standards. Um, the, the, the last aspect, uh, which is uh, cooperation among the standard setters. I think uh, given the, the fast um, evolution of the risks that we are facing, the evolution of technology, the methods that uh, are used, I think it's really key that we joined our effort to analyze the, uh, analyze the risk and being able to um, provide the financial sector with consistent regulations. That's also if we, uh, if we are successful in providing consistent regulation, we will also lower the cost of this regulation because we will be consistent. That's it. Okay, many thanks all the speakers. Incredibly rich exchange. I appreciate very much, actually, very useful information that you have conveyed uh, to, all, to all of us. I think it's clear to everyone, particularly in the official sector, regulators of central and central bankers, and when you approach this topic, you immediately have a sense of fear that uh, what is going on, which is moving very fast, obviously may actually disrupt potentially in a significant way uh, both the monetary and the, and the financial system, right? And the very fact that immediately when you try to dig deeper into the issues, you find how complex things are, how relevant the barriers to entry are, this does not help dissipating actually that, uh, that fear. So I very much hope that this session at least has helped all of us to understand slightly better the issues at the stake and also that help us especially to, to, to be a little bit reassured that the standard setting bodies are looking and working hard on the matter, trying to identify the relevant risk, trying actually to identify the right regulatory response, and particularly they are making important efforts to coordinate with each other. So to, to have some point in the future, a consistent policy approach to these important developments. With that, let me thank you once again, the speakers, all the audience, has been a very good session. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.